questions wherever you are, welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. Hope everybody's having a phenomenal week this week. Man, winter is peaking its head. I think uh, temperature here in the Kiski was maybe like 30 degrees, maybe a little cooler last night. It's going to be snowing before we know it. I hope everybody's got some great Halloween plans. Today, we have a very special guest, a returning guest, Governor Mike Dunleavy. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska show. Hey, John, it's great to be on. And, uh, I happen to like the cold. I know I'm a little strange in that respect, but it uh, works out well since I live in Alaska. I like the snow, like snow machine. Uh, so actually, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, there's something about the first snow that just a little, it's, it has a calming effect on everything. So it's always beautiful <laughs> to see that first snow. Yeah, that's, when, that's when everybody buys their tickets for February <laughs> to go to Hawaii, I know. But anyway, um, great to be here. Well, I'm excited you're on. We'll ha- cover a couple topics uh, today. You know, first, I want to get your thoughts. You're uniquely qualified to talk about education. You were a teacher, you were a principal, you were a superintendent, um, and then you were on the school board, I think, as the president for a couple years in the Matsu Borough. Talk to me about your thoughts on education reform as it relates to Alaska. I know you did, you signed the Reeds Act last year. Um, you have uh, some Facebook ads going on right now. What are your thoughts on education reform? Well, it's unfortunate that we have to call it reform because the whole idea of education is really providing a, a child with that aha moment where they learn things. But what we have found is when, you know, uh, uh, with regard to standardized testing, whether it's the NAEP test that's administered through four, 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 grades four through eight nationwide periodically, to determine where students are in those grade levels kind of gives you an, an idea how they're performing. <clears throat> Alaska hasn't been doing well lately. And, you know, there's one side of the coin that says the solution is more money. I, I get that we need to put money into education. I really do. But there's another side that says, okay, when the money's put in there besides servicing the, uh, the, you know, the maintenance of the buildings, we have to pay our teachers well. We all agree to that. Et cetera, et cetera. What are you going to do differently to get different outcomes? Because if we're not going to do anything differently, uh, we may end up getting the same outcome, outcomes, which over the last several years uh, has been a, uh, uh, a decrease in performance in math, reading, et cetera. The other side is let's get those outcomes changed by doing things a little bit differently. And so, you know, and I think a lot of Alaskans know that there was a study that came out almost a year ago from Harvard. And what the study showed, it was the first study ever done on measuring the outputs of charter schools. There's been studies that have been done that measure the inputs, how much money goes in, what does the governance structure look like, the parental uh, uh, committees, et cetera, the laws uh, in different states, those inputs were studied. But the outcomes, this is the first study that really studied outcomes. And what it showed was, I was very surprised, I think a lot of other people were surprised, that Alaska has the best charter school system in the country. Now, when we, we touted that study, and Harvard's not known to be a conservative think tank, to be perfectly honest with you, but when we touted that study, uh, unfortunately, it wasn't a surprise that outfits such as NEA Alaska and others came out and started to question, question the studies. And for the life of me, I could never understand why something that could be such a great thing, we have the best charter schools, would be viewed by some as almost a threat, but a threat to what? A threat to the status quo, most likely. And so we had the conversation last year, as as you know, and a lot of others know, on increasing our ability to expand our charter school system, because we have charter schools that have wait lists on them. We certainly have an interest in charter schools. We have a a great interest in our homeschools, both uh, homeschooling that is not associated with the state and homeschooling that is associated with the state. And I think most of us believe that our kids could be performing much better. Um, and that's going to be a, a big topic of conversation this coming session as well. We um, we put money in education this past year. I know 
Uh, I know some, again, associated with, um, excuse me, <coughs> NEA says we didn't. We put in a lot of money in education, a lot of inflationary costs we have to deal with. But nonetheless, when we go into next year, we got to have this conversation. Why don't we want to expand our charter schools? It would be one thing if the Harvard study showed that we had the worst charter schools in the country. We have the best charter schools in the country. Why would we want to expand the best of something that we have? And so that's going to be a discussion along with our home schools um, uh, going into this uh, next session. Nice. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, you know, I think uh, you, you had a you had a unique plan. I think last year it was where you, you said, let's get some more money in the hands of the actual teachers instead of bloating budgets or million dollars worth of new curriculum. You had a kind of a bonus structure plan for teachers that were, you know, to retain good teachers and to uh, really give them a kudos for doing a good job. Tell me a little bit about that plan and, and uh, where it's at and, and uh, where it's at in the mix. Yeah, well, let me first start off by saying I was flabbergasted because that plan was killed by NEA uh, and their friends in the legislature. So what, what that, you know, I, I was a teacher. I taught rural Alaska. I've been an administrator in rural and urban Alaska, Matt Sue, as you mentioned, school board president, worked for the university system in their K-12 uh, unit, also was a contractor with the Department of Education. So I've kind of done a lot of education. And when I was with the Mentor Project and I was the manager of the Mentor Project for about seven years, one of the things that kept coming up was um, salaries for teachers, pay for teachers. Uh, teachers don't get paid as much as other uh, professions. We know that. And so what we proposed was a bonus structure where if you were going to teach in the most remote districts in the state, small districts, expensive districts, districts that are having a hard time retaining, recruiting, retaining teachers, we would pay you more, substantially more, to study if that pay, uh, that bonus, would keep, retain and keep teachers there. We looked at it as a three-year study, and then we can, after the three years, we could ascertain whether it worked or not. So in some of the most remote school districts, they would be paid $15,000 each. And if they stayed for three years, a teacher could make $45,000 extra dollars. We thought that could help with the teacher paying off their loans, uh, uh, putting a down payment on a house. So a lot of the things that you know I think Americans expect to be able to do. $10,000 for districts that weren't quite as remote, but still rural. And $5,000 for districts such as yours in the Kenai and ours in Matsu and Anchorage and so forth. Feedback we got is the teachers love it. The feedback we got from uh, NEA Alaska was they didn't. They didn't like that idea. You're going to have to ask them why, you know, maybe do an interview with the uh, head of NEA Alaska as to why you didn't want to pay or give teacher bonuses so that they could be recruited and retained. Made no sense to me, just like it doesn't make sense to not expand our charter schools. That makes no sense. These were good ideas. These, these are ideas that would work. These are ideas that have um, uh, at least some data behind them. Nope. We just want an increase in the BSA and that's all there is to it. Yeah. And so, the teachers are the most important component of a school, always have been. Going back to Aristotle and Socrates as tutors and mentors to folks like Alexander the Great and others in the, in the ancient, uh, ancient world. Your founding fathers did not graduate from West High uh, or, or, or some other uh, you know, neighborhood high school. They, for the most part, were homeschooled and home educated. Uh, many of them were speaking multiple languages as children. Uh, understanding physics, science, geometry. So many of us believe that our students can perform better, but many of us believe that the current environment really doesn't demand better performance across the board. So we want to help our teachers. We want to help our students. We want to help our parents. Um, and hopefully we can get uh, folks in Juno that are going to want to do the same thing that we're talking about. Nice. So what kind of advice would you give parents? You know, you've you've went from um, uh, being a teacher in remote Alaska to being the governor of the state of Alaska, making uh, different steps along the way. What advice would you give to a parent who feels like, man, how do I even make a difference in this? Education seems to be such a big thing to tackle. Why even try? What kinds of things could they do in their own neck of the woods to make a difference uh, possibly, because I think sometimes feel people feel lost and how, how do they go about helping produce change? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, the first thing I would say is uh, 
support your local teachers, your your teachers that you're 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 sending your kids to, because teachers, you know, contrary to what some believe, teachers go into the profession because they want to help kids. They really do. They want to help uh, help kids learn how to read. They want to help them learn how to write and so forth. But education has been so politicized over the years as to what to teach, how to teach it, what's more important, reading or uh, or understanding things like social justice or, or gender, that sort of thing. We're having those conversations as we speak now. And so um, sending your child to a school that best meets your needs as well as your child's and your value system, if you can find a school that does that. Having constant contact with a teacher in a positive way helps, helps tremendously too. And for those that are contemplating a charter school or those that are contemplating homeschool, do, do your research now because there may be some of those schools and some of those approaches at education that actually work better for your child. But you, you have to become engaged. It's tough for some, some folks, right, John, as we know, because you, you sometimes you have single moms or you have two working parents that might have more than one job trying to make ends meet. So they have to rely on the local schools at the school and the local school system. Um, but be engaged as much as possible. I can recall that when my wife, uh, Rose, uh, found out that she was going to have a baby, she became pregnant, she would read to herself at night, read to the baby that was growing. When the kids were born, she would constantly read to the kids. And this is, a, this is an individual that grew up 500 miles from Anchorage on a river back in the 60s when there was no real communication, a lot less travel. But they learned how to read. They were able to read. So that was one of the reasons why we, we focused on the Reads Act a couple of years ago. Myself and others, including uh, Tom Begich and some Democrats and Republicans, came together because they had the same belief that I have. And that is you just got to lay out the expectations and kids will rise to those expectations. Um, and again, that's going to be part of the conversation we're going to have this year. But uh, parents can do a lot when it comes to reading. Parents, parents can do a lot when it comes to discussing what's going on uh, with their kids at school. Parents could do a lot in supporting their local teachers, too, because a lot of times it's a tough, tough time to be a teacher, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, I want to echo that. I think it's, you know, we're blessed here on the Kenai Peninsula with some great teachers. My kids have awesome teachers. And the, the biggest thing I can do to help them in their education is to be a support to the teacher sometimes, because you're right, their job's been politicized when they probably don't want it to be. So, yeah, yeah. I got a question for you, Governor. So um, if you go on Dan Sullivan's official Senator webpage, he's got this great uh, per, uh, PDF of 66 executive orders that the Biden administration has done against Alaska. Talk to me a little bit about the Biden administration's stance ag against Alaska, really, and against resource development, against all the things that Alaskans care about. How has that affected us in the last couple of years, and what have we been doing to kind of com combat that? Well, first of all, I want to commend uh, Dan and his staff. They've done, a, they've done a great job at identifying and laying out in a real easy method to read all the actions that this administration has taken against Alaska. If you were, if you, if, if you didn't know any better and you were to erase the name Alaska, you would think this was a, um, a country that the Biden administration was sanctioning heavily, a, a terrorist dictatorship, uh, a horrible place that treats its minorities terrible and it has child labor, et cetera, et cetera. By God, we need to uh, sanction this place. It's not. It's Alaska. And and part of it is, a uh, big part of it is the social social engineering that's occurring with this administration. Uh, they certainly are not friends to fossil fuels. They certainly are not friends to co uh, coal, especially. Uh, they don't want the forest touched. Uh, they basically don't want anything happening in Alaska. They really don't want anything really happening in the country. A lot of this is stuff there they, they would prefer to have it outsourced or not done at all. And it's kind of a um, it's kind of a fairy tale view of the world that you don't do something here that they view as bad, then nothing bad happens and everything good happens. You end up offshoring all these opportunities to places like China, Iran, Venezuela. And we lose the jobs here in Alaska. We lose the revenue here in Alaska. The country loses the wealth. The country loses um, its national security, its strategic security to be able to take care of itself by offshoring these things. And so, um, you know, I, I know that this is going to come as a shock, but um, I'm really looking forward to the election in November. And I'm hoping and praying that we have terrific outcomes because Alaska, as the premier resource development state, <clears throat> and I'm sure we're going to get into a discussion about our neighbors, the Russians and the Chinese and the Koreans. 
in, a, in being in a difficult neighborhood. We need um, we need the ability to take advantage of every opportunity we can in Alaska to put people to work, to be able to supply America and our allies with uh, natural resources. I mean, we were the ones that pioneered natural gas in 1968 from a place called the Kiski. <laughs> the United States of America pioneered the export of natural gas overseas out of Nikiski in the 60s. We sent it to Japan for 50 years until Cook Inlet, the gas supplies ran low. That's a testament to what we can do if we're allowed to do it. And so these 66 sanctions that Dan and his staff have highlighted so well, I call them sanctions. And I've spoken with congressmen and senators in Washington, and I refer to them as sanctions because that's essentially what they are. Through a number of executive orders, the Biden administration has basically said, Alaska, you can't do certain things. And not only that, this is important, something for your viewers to watch. Under the Jobs Act that was passed under President Trump in 2017 by Congress, that opened up Anwar to oil lease sales. Those sales took place, but under duress by this administration that, uh, that has come in. And they have done everything they can to kill those leases. And not only that, what people don't understand is that law compelled this administration to have another lease sale no later than December of this year. Most of us believe they're going to violate the law there as well. So it's not just executive orders. It's an actual violation of a congressional act. Anwar's leases are supposed to go up. They're supposed to go out for sale. Um, and they're supposed to go out for sale again in a second round here in December. Uh, I hope you're. I hope those that are watching this podcast follow that because I'd be willing to bet a large sum of money uh, that that doesn't happen under this administration. Another violation of law. Yeah, it's it's um, unfortunate to see the Biden administration continue to do this, uh, but I, I'm, I echo you. Kudos to Senator Sullivan. You know, he actually, I think um, it was a month or so ago. He read into the congressional record uh, a kudos to Suzanne Downing and Must Read Alaska for her work uh, in Must Read Alaska. And I thought that was really cool. He went above and beyond to do that. And so thanks, Senator Sullivan, for doing that. Um, last question to you is this, Governor. You know, recently, you know, it seems like every couple months we see like Russian uh, aircraft months. in the air. A couple uh, months, it's almost every week now. <laughs> every week. Talk to me a little bit about that. I saw a video where uh, a, a U.S. plane had to basically swerve out of the way because a Russian plane almost hit it. Um, it that, that video went viral. Talk to me a little bit about what's going on. So unlike any other state in the country, we are the true fort for North America. Alaska is. We, li we live in a dangerous neighborhood. We have the Russians a few miles away. We have the Chinese flying over as well with the Russians and joint exercises, but also uh, plying the uh, Bering Sea and going to the Arctic with their uh, with their ships. Um, and of course, we are under the uh, North Korea. We're within reach of North Korean missiles. That's why we have a a, a robust approach at uh, Fort Greeley um, to to protect ourselves in the event that the Koreans totally lose their mind and launch missiles. Um, the Russians are doing this, in my opinion, just to remind America that they're still there. They're having a rough time in the Ukraine, obviously. And so on their far eastern front, which is our far western front, uh, they're, I think they're doing this to just remind us that they're still relevant, that they still have modern aircraft, and uh, uh, just to be able to show their people at home, too, that they're, uh, they're flexing their muscles. Chinese, I think, are more concerning. Chinese have built four going on five icebreakers. They declare themselves a near-Arctic nation. Now, this may come as a surprise to a lot of our readers, but uh, America has about 12 icebreakers. Nine of them are in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes, which obviously we have a friendly neighbor to the north, Canada, on the Great Lakes and the United States to the south. But we have nine icebreakers on the Great Lakes. I get it. There's a lot of commerce there. Uh, in Alaska, we really only have one icebreaker that's assigned to Alaska. That's ported in Seattle which would be the equivalent of, uh, if you want to reach Nome from Seattle, that's like going from California to New York. Yeah. Um, there's talk about, and I think there's been some action on uh, building one or two more icebreakers, but the Russians have about 46 to 47 icebreakers. Chinese have four or five. We are woefully behind in our, def uh, I think our defense of um, 
the Arctic Ocean and the Bering Sea with regard to icebreakers woefully behind. We do have a robust assets at uh, J Bear up at Wayne Wright and Eielson as well. And as I mentioned, the missiles. But nonetheless, um, this neighborhood is just going to get a little more active and possibly a little more dangerous, especially if things continue to warm and we see, see more ship traffic. So Alaska has always been a pivotal point on the globe. It's going to become more so. Um, and unless we have the right administration in Washington that recognizes this, uh, we're going to fall further and further behind. And quite honestly, um, I think currently what's in Washington doesn't really recognize the absolute danger that's out there and the advantage that the Russians and the Chinese currently have um, on, uh, on Alaska with regard to, especially in the, in the realm of ice breaking. Yeah. Well, my last question to you is this, Governor. I want to be mindful of your time. Are you hopeful for Alaska and why? Uh, very hopeful. I'm always an optimist. I mean, they, you know, for thousands of years, there have been those that have counted mankind out. Uh, for 200, almost 250 years, they've kind of counted the uh, U.S. out. There's always been these times throughout the U.S. where people say, well, this is it, you know. And the same, uh, the same for Alaska. Um, Alaska was built upon a dream by William Seward and others that you could have this resource storehouse like no other, which we are located in a very, very crucial point on the globe, which at the time wasn't realized to the extent that it is today. The second busiest cargo airport in the United States and the third busiest in the world and our cargo traffic continues to pick up. And I wouldn't be surprised in a few short years if we become the second busiest in, in, in the world because of our location. As I mentioned with regard to defense, uh, possible shipments through the Arctic and through the Bering Sea to, to Asia, Alaska is in a pivotal spot. And our resources are really the solution to a lot of this country and the world's problems. Everything from timber to oil to gas, uh, rare earths, you name it. So I'm incredibly hopeful. The problem with Alaska isn't Alaska. The problem with Alaska is not where it's situated or its minerals. The problem with Alaska, for the most part, are policymakers that either want to destroy opportunity here in Alaska coming out of Washington or don't believe in itself by even individuals here that live in the state. Um, Alaska's motto, North of the Future, is really, it's a, it's, a dreamer's, it's a dreamer's motto. It really is. And I'm one of those dreamers. I really believe that Alaska's best years are ahead of it because of the reasons I stated. It's got to make sure we get uh, good policy in place and we get a, an administration in, uh, in Washington, D.C. that is going to recognize that Alaska is pivotal in, in the role in supplying this country with the minerals, but also its strategic location. So, I'm very optimistic. Hope you are, John. Just got to get the right people in the right spots. Well, I appreciate you joining us here on the Must Read Alaska Show. Governor, welcome back anytime. Uh, for folks that listen, watch, and read Must Read Alaska, you want to help keep the lights on, just go to mustreadalaska.com on the right-hand side. There's a little donate button. Every $5, $10, $100 helps keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska. If you want to sponsor the show, just email me, John, J-O-H-N, at mustreadalaska.com. Dot com. I want to thank everybody again for listening. Until next time, I'm John Quick from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks, Governor.